First I heard the word gay associated with me holding hands with my buddy. Now I'm hearing that I look feminine, gay feminine. I'm hearing these two words from angry men. From that point after that happened, I was, I put it in my head, I was like, I have to be as like, as not this as possible. So can you talk um, a little bit about how you feel right now? I get anxious before I do any sort of speaking thing. I really value the words of people and uh, the words that I leave with people as well. Can you talk about um, what your style says about you? There are people who have scrapbooks, people have yearbooks, and I have tattoos. You know, if my house was ever on fire, I would be able to run out like hands free because every single thing that, I, that means something to me like the most is tattooed on my body. I love jewelry more than I love clothes. One of the necklaces that I have contains the ashes of uh, someone very, very, very dear to me who unfortunately passed away two years ago. It's a piece of jewelry, but it's a piece of a person, even though it isn't physically here, uh, is still very much so a part of my life. Can you talk about the assumptions that people make about you based on your appearance? You know, people think that you know, I'm a drug dealer or I'm an ex-convict. I once was at a, a party and a fight had broken out and it was like a, like a fashion party. But there was this guy there uh, who was white, who was heavily tattooed as well. And when the authorities came, there was a girl describing the situation and she was describing who was trying to stop the fight. As she was talking to the officer, she said, yeah, um, the white rock star looking guy and the black thuggish looking guy. And I once was on a set and they were like doing my hair in the mirror and as I'm talking, this girl who was there who I'm not even sure what her role was uh, on the set, but she said, you speak really nice for a black man. I just like looked over her and I was like, do you believe that what you said was a compliment? What if I told you you didn't look stupid for a white person? There's such a lack of accountability when it comes to the way that we have been conditioned to address things that we don't understand. I'm still gonna hear you out. Because if I spend my entire life listening to people who only agree with me, I'm not gonna be able to grow. But there are definitely certain things where it's, it's beyond like a disagreement. For me personally, when it comes to trans rights, I'm not having a conversation with you. I'm not gonna debate with you human life that is here and valid. Can you take off whatever you want to take off? Yeah. Like about your tattoos and like, and like what they mean to you and kind of your journey with that. When I first started getting tattooed, I was an addict and I was a teenager and there were friends of mine who were passing away or uh, were killed for being in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. And I started to get you know, pieces to commemorate these lives. I was living in Florida at the time. I was aggressively bullied. It was a pretty white school. I got the shit beaten out of me by guys who I uh, called friend. Half of it also stemmed you know, from my struggles of not coming out yet. Because there was this other being who was also me, who was trying to breathe, and I was suffocating him. And I remember I played Little League Baseball when I was like seven, eight years old. There was this kid on the team. We were like super close. We would go in and out of the dugout holding hands. The assistant coach and his dad pulled us aside and said that we can't hold hands walking out of the dugout for the games. In my little mind, I was like, oh, they must want us to be like prepared. So we didn't hold hands walking out, but we did hold hands walking back in when the game was done. He like shouted at me. And that was when the assistant coach says like, you can't do it because it looks gay. And that was the first time I'd ever heard the word gay in my life. I remember going home and I typed in the word gay in Yahoo search. And it was like people kissing, same sex people kissing. And I was like, this is like, this looks like pretty normal. But it's like, but he called it this. But like he said, it's so mean. And I was doing this action because I felt loved and warm and comfortable and welcome. But now there's this word that makes this guy angry that he associates with this thing. My uncle once 
pointed out to me that I was hanging my hand like a girl, kind of like mocking me. And I was like, what? And I'm like 10. First I heard the word gay associated with me holding hands with my buddy. Now I'm hearing that I look feminine, gay feminine. I'm hearing these two words from angry men. From that point, after that happened, I was, I put it in my head, I was like, I have to be as like, as not this as possible. And it's like, why in the world am I having to suppress the way that I was born and who I am so that you, so that you can live comfortably? I tried to kill myself when I was a teenager, when I was uh, 15, and I had uh, unfortunately gotten acquainted uh, with this older gentleman at the time who um, do what older gentlemen do to... Pray. Yeah. Because I wasn't out to anyone, and like no one knew about me being queer, I did all the convincing I could do mentally to tell myself that there was nothing wrong with that situation. He had gotten me even more involved in the drugs that I was doing. It was introducing me to new drugs and uh, put me in absolutely horrendous situations. I felt like I was waking up with bricks tied to my ankles and my hands, trying to brush my teeth. You know, I'm just dragging my body along. I hid all of this from my family. I didn't tell my parents <clears throat> until I got gotten clean. Because even though I was like at, like at a war with my brain, my mind was also like, they can't know you're gay. What was your fear? That sweet word that humans shy away from all the time, rejection. What was the turning point out of like addiction, all the low self-worth and struggle that you were feeling in your teen years? When I was 17 years old, I was at a camp helping my dad. I start to walk outside of the venue and it was at a hotel. I'm talking out loud and I'm like, you know, like God, like if you're real, I need something. I'm really struggling here. And that morning I, I used. In my head I was gonna say, wash me clean, but I said, I need you to wash. And before I could get the shh, this woman who was on the second floor of her room, emptied her ice bucket. And it was just melted water, cold water. And it fell all over me. I'm just soaked. I'm soaked in water like I was baptized. And I looked up and she was like, I'm so sorry. And I was like, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And that was the last day I used. And did you come out? How did you already come out? Yeah, I came out before. Like, I came out before I was, I came out when I was 16. And where did you receive the rejection that you feared? Rejection, but not in a um, hostile way. Like, there were certain friends I had who just didn't want to hang out with me anymore. People in my family who, yeah. Which is why I'm like, I take family so seriously. Because I can meet someone once from the day that I die, say like, you're the rare family. I just always want to make sure that everyone is okay, that people are fed, feel loved and cared about. And there are times where I think that that's probably going to be like how I get killed, just thinking about someone that's not me. I like struggle knowing that there's people who don't have anything. I just want to make sure that they're okay, you know? because I can't be everywhere. And that bothers me. Can you just like take us through a little bit of that journey of like discovering kind of the tectonic plates moving and kind of coming into your own voice and your own power? Yeah, after I got clean and got washed, I for the first time actually heard myself. And so I began uh, volunteering in my neighborhood going to uh, youth groups to speak and talk about um, what my life was like as an addict. At that time in my life, I had lost 10 to 15 of my friends from drugs. And so when I would go to these schools, I would bring a photograph of all of my friends. You know, a lot of times when we talk about addiction, we talk about the drugs that we used and um, where we used them, but we never talk about the people we were with. Even as recovering addicts, you're only associated with like this one part of you. I got introduced to social media and a friend of mine, she was murdered, she's trans, 
that posted about her as a woman crush Wednesday, like a memorial post. And then I got people messaging me and telling me like, you know, thank you for doing this. A friend of mine who was trans was killed uh, last year. And it was borderline impossible to find any information where she wasn't misgendered. If I was disrespected, mistreated, and not acknowledged in life, my spirit would be at such unrest if I was treated the same way in death. I started to make these posts remembering these lives that were being taken the way that they wanted to be remembered while they were here. Sometimes when someone has been killed, especially if they don't have like a family member to come and identify the body, it just, I mean, it's just, they don't even care. But it's like, I'm their family. That's my family. Oh, like, what was, what was her real name? There is no such thing. Her name is what she said it was. Am I even just making a post about someone I don't know? It's a post about myself, because we are, we are the same. Can you talk about your current forms of activism? So for the past four years now, I had been going to this uh, senior center um, on Canal Street to uh, provide and feed seniors of New York City. There's this amazing organization called Streetwork Project and we provide uh, wigs and makeup for um, LGBTQ kids uh, who live in shelters here in New York. The other parts of the week would involve me working at the animal shelter. So when quarantine happened, all of these things, I couldn't do them. I was really struggling because volunteering also helps me stay clean. When, I like to call it the awakening, happened to a select million number of people um, took off their glasses and wiped the fog off and put the glasses back on. They were just like, they're still killing black people. And so after uh, a little under a month of attending protest here in New York, I went into my savings account. I packed my duffel bag, two pairs of cowboy boots, and I went to about 26 different states to go to protest and to volunteer and um, to use the money that I had to buy whatever people needed. And so yeah, in my travels and going to these places, I was unfortunately arrested 12 times and jailed four of those 12 times for the arrest. More recently, back here in New York, I was at a protest um, in Washington Square Park. As we're walking, there was this girl leading some of the chants. She steps back on one of the bicycles on accident, and the officer falls backwards off the bike. Boom! This girl gets hit in her breast, and then after, that, after she gets hit, an open hand slaps her across the face. I separated myself from my sister, ran through two or three people, and I pushed him off of her, and he stumbled backwards. When he fell backwards, Two officers grabbed my arms from behind my back like this, kicked my feet from under me and slammed me to the ground, and then turned my face into the pavement, repeatedly punched me in the eye and grabbed my dermal piercing. And I was saying over and over again, I'm not resisting, get the fuck off of me. I tell myself, if this is what this guy is gonna do in front of all of these people to this defenseless girl, what does he do at home? What's happening where there aren't eyes? Yes, people are setting fire to targets, but imagine 400 years of being in an abusive relationship with the same person. Imagine dating somebody for five years and they're beating the shit out of you, but they also feed you. And then one day you find out that there are 1,600 other people who are all in the same abusive relationship. And then you say to yourself, how are we gonna respond to this? People should be so lucky that all was burned down was a target. Imagine if all this aggression was taken to the neighborhoods of white people. You're so broken down that you still, even in your pain and your anger, don't want anyone to feel the same way you feel right now that you felt your whole life. You don't want that. So you're bringing down a store instead. This is all a response to abuse, and people respond to abuse differently. When do you feel the most 
vulnerable. When I'm by myself. Why? Uh, there's like no hiding. Why are you afraid for people to see? How afraid I am to not be everything to everyone. Now that I am myself, I am so myself that I don't want to let people down. I try to hide that from people so they don't know that I'm always in fear of letting my own self down. So when do you feel the most like, beautiful? My most vulnerable and most beautiful times is when I'm hanging out by myself. I do this thing called a self date. I take myself out on a date, I get dressed up really nice and I put my phone on airplane mode. And I just go out to eat and I go to a movie and I just hang out in my space. I love being able to hear myself, especially being sober. And so I'm able to comfortably exist with me. And so I feel beautiful. Why in your body, in your skin, in your journey, why is it a good place to be? Because it's important for not only others, but for myself to see that I survived and that it is possible to survive. But also, um, surviving doesn't mean that you're living, but I'm doing both. I'm so blessed to say that. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. This was absolutely amazing. <laughs> of course. Amazing. Thank you so much. It was really like incredibly powerful and we knew it was going to be it. Wow. Thank you. Hi, we're Elisa and Lily, the mother and daughter creators of Style Like You. You can get the extended version of this interview in the What's Underneath podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. If you are inspired by Eves' story and want to hear more like this, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel over here. And don't forget to click the bell so each Thursday you're reminded of when we've dropped a new episode. And thank you from the bottom of our hearts to all of our members who continually support our growth. You can join them by heading over to patreon.com slash style like you.